Welcome to OZK 150. We're going to be talking about folk customs and traditions today. Uh, some of this will overlap a little bit with our earlier discussion on folk arts and, and things like that, but, but mostly we're, we're in a different territory today. There's a lot of folk stuff that we do when we study the Ozarks, folk music, folk, folk ways, folk medicine. We'll get into a little folk medicine today, and, and so... Uh, it's, hopefully it'll be a, a fun topic, but before we get to it, we've got our usual uh, famous Ozarker of the day. Now, Butch, if you, if you get this one, I'm really going to be impressed. I, I'm guessing this is a grainy color photo. You're still, you're still tore up about Maul Barker, huh? Anybody know this fella? Again, using the term famous very loosely. Uh, but if you had been around back in his heyday in the 70s and, and 80s, you may have recognized this fella. His name was Junior Cobb. And you can see there he just died uh, the year before last. And Junior Cobb was a woodcarver and quite a renowned woodcarver. He uh, lived in a little community in Baxter County, Arkansas called Three Brothers. Anybody ever been to Three Brothers, Arkansas? There's nothing really much there anymore. And, uh, but he was from Three Brothers, and you can see there that, uh, that his art is, as far as I know, it's, some of it is still on display at the Smithsonian, and uh, there were articles about him in national magazines. Uh, I've got a little book that was published around 1980, uh, and there's, a, there's an entire chapter devoted to the, the art and woodwork of, of Junior Cobb. So he was quite a well-known figure. He was uneducated, uh, a real Ozark backwoodsman, you might say, and... Uh, and uh, as you can see here, he held up his end of the bargain. And by, by all accounts, uh, when I, I read his obituary in the Mountain Home, Arkansas, that's what, uh, Three Brothers is pretty close to Mountain Home, if you've heard of that or been there. And uh, the Mountain Home paper had an obituary, pretty extended obituary when he died. And apparently he had gone through what money he had and, you know, was just kind of, he was just coasting on fumes by the, by the end there. He wasn't all that well off at all. And that's a good name, you know, for a, for a backwoodsman of the Ozarks. It doesn't get any better than Junior Cobb, right? All right, how about today's word? Somebody may know this one. First of all, how, how do you think it's pronounced? Probably depends on what part of the Ozarks you're from. Uh, LARPIN is how I've always heard it, LARPIN. Uh, you, can, you could also say LARPIN if you wanted to put all the syllables in there, the way it's spelled. That's something I wouldn't recommend if you're in the Ozarks. You've got to leave out at least one syllable for most words. Uh, but we'll call it LARPIN. Does anybody have a clue what LARPIN is? Yeah, with the last T, I bet you. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a good guess that it's kind of like lassoing, but, uh, but no, that's not right. It's... Not really even close. Lying? Lying? Like telling a lie? No, it's not, not that either. But uh, no, this, it's, not a, it's not a verb. It's actually an adjective. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an adjective. Yeah. Well, no one, no one knows this. I'm taking it. All right. Well, well LARPing means very tasty. If something is LARPing, then it's just the best thing you've ever ate. Scrumptious. Now, I, personally, I've never eaten any hominy that I would consider LARPing. It's not, it's not one of those foods you tend to think is just kind of mouth-watering. Well, it may be mouth-watering, but not for the reasons, you know, we think of good, tasty food being mouth-watering. But... Uh, I guess some people who have a hankering for hominy think it's LARPing, right? 
Yeah. Anybody like hominy? Well, we got some people. Have you ever ate uh, like old style homemade hominy with uh, with like the the live from ashes and probably not. Yeah. Where you where you actually take uh, you know you get you can uh, you run water through ashes and uh, soak it down and after you know after a few days or however long you get uh, you get lye out of that and the way they used to make the hominy in the rural Ozarks is they would soak the corn these hard grain kernels of, of corn in this lye and it would just you know just take the the husks and you'd be left with you know the hominy the inside of the the corn, the soft inside part of it, and then you had to wash it real good because you don't want to be eating the, the lye. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, that's kind of one of those lost arts, too. I'm sure there are a few old-timers who, uh, who know how to make hominy the old-style old way, but uh, most of the time it's going to be out of a can or something nowadays. Yeah. All right, so that's our... Word and our person, I'll guarantee you, Junior Cobb ate some hominy. I'd be, I'd be disappointed if he didn't. All right, let's talk a little bit about folk customs and traditions. And I brought, uh, we don't do a lot of formal definitions in Ozark studies, but I brought... Uh, a couple of definitions of folkways or folk customs, and uh, they may not tell you any more than you already know, but this is a sociologist definition of the term folkways, uh, similar to what we'll be talking about folk customs. Folkways are a type of norm and are often referred to as customs. They are norms for everyday behavior that people follow for the sake of tradition or convenience. Breaking a folkway does not usually have serious consequences Cultural forms of dress or food habits are examples of folkways. So that's one definition. And I've got this other thing. Uh, folk customs are the things people do, like playing games, celebrating holidays and weddings, in which action is just as important as the final product itself. For example, birthdays and family folk groups are usually celebrations. How each family decides to celebrate a birthday reflects the family's sense of self and traditions. And then it goes on about foodways and, and holidays and all that kind of stuff. But that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about. We all sort of intrinsically know what folk customs are. Uh, we all take part in folk customs, even though we may not always think of them in, in that term. Uh, we have, you know, there are broader American folk customs, there are regional folk customs, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight, are uh, some specific regional folk customs, or at least folk customs, folk ways that uh, used to be prolific in the Ozarks and uh, could be found in the rural Ozarks well into the 20th century, if not into the late 20th century. So we'll be talking about a few of those. Now, one of the reasons that uh, the Ozarks became associated not just with folk music, as we've talked about earlier, but with the survival of folk customs, folk ways, folk traditions, is because the Ozarks tended to be more isolated, a little more rugged than uh, most other parts of the country. Uh, we didn't have, uh, we weren't necessarily on the beaten path to anywhere. And so you, because of that little bit of isolation that the Ozarks had, and it, it can be overblown, as, as we'll talk about in, in future uh, classes, uh, you, you had the survival of some of these folk customs, folk ways, longer than you had them in other parts of the United States. And so one of the things that's, that's neat, in the, in the 1970s, and if you could remember the 1970s, you probably remember this, in the 70s, there was this, kind of, this uh, real strong interest in history brought on by the celebration of the Bicentennial. And one of the things that the Bicentennial did uh, and all the historical fascination that, that surrounded it in the, in the mid-1970s is it caused a lot of people 
who were on up in age at that time to write memoirs. And there were a whole bunch of people in the Ozarks in the 1970s and into the 1980s who wrote memoirs or who wrote just their reminiscences of growing up in the region. And it was especially pertinent for that generation to write those memoirs because these were people who were in their 70s and 80s. They were people who had been born around the turn of the 20th century. They were people who had who had seen tremendous changes in material life in the Ozarks. They had gone from the days of horses and buggies and wagons, and in some cases, uh, even ox-drawn plows and things like that, uh, all the way into the, into the atomic age and into the age past the you know, Americans walking on the moon and, and all that kind of stuff, even though probably some of those old Ozarkers didn't believe they had actually walked on the moon. You know, that there are still those conspiracy theorists out there. But they had, you can imagine just all the stuff they had seen. And so it was, it was really important for a lot of them to write down these memories. And what you get in a lot of these books is just this wealth of information on folkways that by the 1970s and 1980s were, for the most part, they weren't lost, but they were, for the most part, living in the memories of these older people who had grown up doing these things, whether it was making uh, hominy, the old homemade old style, or uh, all these various other things that we're going to talk about, planting uh, crops and planting gardens uh, by the signs, as we'll talk about, or using traditional medicines that they got out of the forests and out of the fields and off of animals and things like that. So these people just had this wealth of, of knowledge of things that had been passed down through the generations to them. They were, they were folk ways, folk traditions. And for the most part, they were being lost in this kind of homogenizing American culture. And uh, what we're going to talk about today are some of those folk ways that those people were talking about and writing about back in the 70s. And a lot of the, a lot of the, the best places to go to find out that stuff uh, are some of those just memories of old-timers from the days, or the writings of Vance Randolph. Uh, one of the things we'll do is uh, I'll share with you uh, some of Vance Randolph's Ozark Magic and Folklore. Really good book. I've uh, assigned it for this class in the, in the past, but, uh, but not this year. But there's just a wealth of information on folkways and traditions in this book, and we'll talk about some of those in a minute. But we'll look at things to do with farming, health, courtship and marriage, birth and death. We've already looked at some of the courtship and marriage stuff when we talked about chivalries and infairs and, and that kind of stuff, so we won't dwell on that a lot. But a lot of the other stuff is, uh, will be pretty new territory for us. All right, let's look at the signs Now, for generations in, uh, around the, the world, it was very common for common people to do many things according to the signs, the astrological signs. Now, in the rural Ozarks in the 19th and, and into the 20th centuries, most people didn't use the, the names for the signs that, that we recognize in our astrological charts or Whatever, whatever those things appear in. I guess they still show up in newspapers. Uh, what's your, what do you call that? The horoscope. Yeah, your horoscope. I couldn't think of that, that word. But so you, most uh, people in the rural Ozarks weren't referring to Taurus and Leo and Virgo and all this kind of stuff. They used the body part signs that corresponded with all these, uh, with the astrological signs. Uh, so that Capricorn was the knees, Scorpio, they would, uh, most traditional Ozarkers wouldn't say genitals, they would say privates or secrets. Uh, Virgo was the intestines or the guts, uh, Leo the heart, and, and so on. And you can see all up through there. But all of these, all of the, the signs corresponded with some sort of body part or body parts. 
And these were all important when it came to doing basic things like knowing when to plant crops, when to, uh, to perform certain kinds of uh, medical uh, procedures on animals or humans. Uh, uh, there was just this, this great uh, body of knowledge or what many of us might consider superstition that had been built up over the generations, over the centuries, that corresponded with uh, you know, the heavens and, and what's going on here on earth. And uh, what we'll do is we'll go through and just kind of look at, at some of these uh, as they had to do with farming, and especially just the everyday practice of rural life, handling animals, handling children, all this kind of stuff. So for instance, if you're looking at, since it's getting pretty close to garden time, we're, doesn't seem like it was snow on the ground outside, but we're just a few weeks away from piddling around in the garden. And uh, some people, depending on how you plant by the signs or plant by the dates, some people may have already tried to get in the garden uh, in, in February. It's not unusual for people to try to put, for example, uh, Irish potatoes in the ground in uh, early or mid-February. But uh, tradition had it that you plant uh, beans and cucumbers when the sign is in the arms or Gemini. And that's just one of many things that people did by the signs. Uh, you can see cabbage and lettuce when the sign is in the head. Dig potatoes when the sign is in the feet but only in the light of the moon. All very superstitious. What's it mean to be in the light of the moon? It's what it sounds like. You spoon in the silvery moon, you know? That's when you spoon by the light of the silvery moon? It's, it sounds like it would be you'd be out in the middle of the night you know, under a full moon out there digging stuff. But what the, light, what the light of the moon means is you've heard of a waxing and waning moon or increasing and decreasing moon in the moon cycles. Uh, the light of the moon is when uh, is between the new moon and the full moon when the moon is getting bigger every night or we see more of it every night. That's the light of the moon. That's a, that's a waxing moon or an increasing moon. And the opposite, of course, would be in the dark of the moon, which is a waning moon or a decreasing moon, and that's after the full moon, when the moon is at its peak, and then it starts going back down. So there are all kinds of traditions that you do this in the dark of the moon and this in the light of the moon. And that's what that means. So you got that kind of stuff. Uh, all uh, dehorn and castrate calves when the sign is in the legs. That could come in handy for many of you. The next time you go to castrate something, <laughs> you know, just keep that in mind. When, when is query? <laughs> on the calendar. Uh, well, okay, let's see. I've got it. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's just look. Uh, now here's a, you can still, uh, of course, so, some of you probably get farmer's almanacs. And it tells you each day has a different, there's a sign for that day. I don't know exactly how they, how they do all this stuff. I don't really follow astrology, but there's a sign for each day. And for instance, if you go to February 2013, and this is my calendar from uh, Taylor Feed Mill in Franklin, Arkansas. You can get these from the sale barn or just wherever you, uh, this is a feed mill calendar, but they all kind of, they get them from the same place because they all look alike. And... If you go to February 2013, what is tonight? The 27th? The 27th. So uh, this is Virgo. And uh, anything? We can't do anything. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, this not a recommended day. One of the things you can do in Virgo, I remember, uh, I remember reading this, is that it's a good day to pull weeds and to, uh, to cut down trees. So... 
you know, if, you, if you're uh, wanting to weed your garden, this would have been a good day to, to do it, according to this. But uh, this is Virgo. The next Aquarius uh, will be sometime in, in March. Let's just see what we got here. Uh, March 9th. March 9th and 10th. So... And the next, uh, if you're wanting to wean calves, and this also works with children, you want to get them off the bottle or off the pacifier. Let's see, that's, that's going to be in the knees or Capricorn, so you've got to wait until uh, March 7th to do that. Now this is the only time I've ever followed this advice when uh, uh, my, my son was... Oh, I guess he was two or three years old or so. And like a lot of little kids, he was addicted to his pacifier. And we were trying to, I mean, he was just, you know, just had it with him all the time. And my wife and I were trying to figure out what to do to, to, get, to wean him off of this pacifier. And her grandmother was living at the time. And, you know, an old uh, rural Ozark woman. And she said, uh, she said, wean him when the sign's in the knees. And I didn't have a clue what she was talking about. I, it just... I mean, she might as well have been speaking a foreign language. I really didn't know sign, knees. I understand all the words, but I don't know what they mean all put together. And so we just said, well, tell us when the sign's in the knees. And she told us on such and such a date. And uh, on that date, you know, we took his pacifiers away from him. And uh, he never, it was just like, you know, just cold turkey, fine. You know, he didn't, he didn't need them. You know, I don't know. We didn't try it on a different day. And, you know, he went into, uh, you know, to see if he went on into shock and had all kinds of problems or anything like that. But uh, at least that one instance, it, it seemed to work. And it made me about a halfway believer in, in uh, the old, you know, superstitions of the signs and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Said what day was that again? <laughs> uh, is a, you, got, you got one of those? Uh, yeah. uh, March 7th, I think it was. Yeah, you're trying to break, yeah. One year, I don't know if it's, it, uh, it, it's probably not too early. Uh, but yeah, if you're, if you're looking for uh, the sign in the knees or Capricorn, you got March 7th or March 8th, which is next, next Thursday and Friday. So just, so just gear up for it. And uh, yeah, just, of course, we made a big production of it. Uh, he, I mean, he had like a, like a collection of pacifiers. I mean, there were enough to fill up half of a jar with these things, like a mason jar. And we, uh, we live on a farm, so we, we put all of his, uh, we got his pacifiers, we put them all in a jar, and we drove down in the field, and uh, like in the middle of the cows and stuff, and we told him that we were giving his pacifiers to the cows. And we threw them out the window of the truck. He, you know, he whimpered a little bit and stuff, but he, he liked looking at cows, so that kind of, uh, you know, threw him off a little bit, gave him something to do. And we, we drove back to the house. He never, you know, and I, I later went back and got him. I think they're still behind the seat of my truck. I still got the same truck, you know, all these years later. And I think they're still back there in a, in a jar. If you, you know, if you need any extras, they're probably really ranked by now. But, but uh, uh, it seemed to, you know, that one thing uh, seemed to work. And uh, I, uh, but I've never tried any of these other Things. Now, there are certain things uh, that we'll talk about in a minute, certain dates that you do things in the garden and, and such as that, that I've done because I remember my, my grandparents uh, doing things on a certain date. But uh, my grandparents didn't go by signs that I know of. Most of that, what, what happened with most of that tradition is when people got kind of modern religion, if they fell under the influence of the Methodists, or your more progressive Baptist, or certainly Presbyterians, or anything like that. That was one of the things that went. You know, all the superstition had to be pushed aside. That was just that was silliness for uh, for church people. And so, a lot of uh, Ozarks families left those traditions behind. And where you would you would often find these traditions surviving in uh, remote places in the Ozarks and among people who either weren't terribly religious or belong to churches, maybe like the Pentecostal church or different kind of common people churches that, that didn't challenge those uh, traditions all that much, at least in those early years. We had neighbors who always planted by a phase of the moon, and I don't know what phase it was, yeah. but they always had a great garden. Right. 
And, and, and it's, I'm sure they were probably convinced it was because they were, at least in part, that it was because of that. And it was probably more because they were just really good gardeners and they'd been doing it for a long time. But, uh, you know, there's, to people uh, who, who follow these, these traditions, you know, it's, it means a lot to them. It's, uh, it's something that, you, you know, if, if you always plant according to such and such, the signs and the such and such, you're going to go out of your way to try to do it every year. Now, you might, it might come a flood for two or three days and you miss your date, and then you'd either got to plant them on the wrong day or wait a whole month till the cycle rolls back around, and you got a big decision then. But a lot of people really, uh, really go by these. Let's see, I had a, a few more, and I seem to have left my paper in, in my office. Uh, here are a few more, too. Uh, always plant underground crops like potatoes and turnips and, and that kind of stuff in the dark of the moon. So we've, uh, we're in the dark of the moon now. The, we had a full moon earlier this week, I believe. And I believe we're in the dark of the moon now, so get your taters in the ground if you yeah. want to do that. Uh -huh. Yeah, pretty much anything that, that uh, grows underground... Uh, that's you do that in the dark of the moon, and it would stand a reason then that you plant above ground crops in the light of the moon. So you got a ways to wait for putting your peas and beans and corn and that kind of stuff. Of course, you're not here in Southwest Missouri. You're not going to be putting that those crops in this early, anyhow. Yeah, that's a that's a a bird. Yeah, that's uh, this one obviously. Uh, there are all kinds of traditions that have nothing to do whatsoever with the signs, and this is one of them, just one of hundreds and hundreds of traditions. Uh, this is one that uh, you, you don't plant beans until after, after you hear a whippoorwill in the spring. All right, we, I don't know, and I, and I don't know if it's just if the if it's just the corn that's frostbitten or if it's frostbitten garlic or just garlic, period. I don't really know. I, I'm not sure. I, I, there, may be, there may be some kind of scientific reason for not feeding frostbitten corn to hogs, but I don't know what it is. It's, it's considered a folk tradition in this sense. Uh, garlic, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe get a little flavor in, in the pork, you know, right there. I don't know that you use garlic much with pork products, but uh, I'm not much of a cook. Uh, plant flax on Good Friday. Of course, that's going to be a different day every year. That's not, and Good Friday may be a month different from one year to the next, depending on when Easter is, so that can, that can really throw things off. Does anybody know what flax is? You probably had a, a flaxseed oil, but you may not know what. What uh, people in the 19th century Ozarks would have grown flax for? Not for the oil. Clothing? Right. Uh, for a specific thing to make clothing with, they made uh, linen out of it. That's, what you, that's what, how you get linen. And, uh, a very, and that was, uh, flax was actually pretty commonly grown uh, for much of the 19th century in the Ozarks until it got easier and easier to, to buy store-bought uh, fabrics to, to replace the home spinning and, and making of, of linen. Uh, but that's what flax was. Uh, sow turnips on July 25th. I'm not really sure who came up with that one, but that's just, and you ask another family and they may say sow turnips on July 20th reading, or August 1st. Turnips? What's that? You really mean S -E -W turnips? As in stitch them up? Right, yeah, that's the wrong sow, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it tells you, I, don't, I, I barely know my turnips, so. That's not too late, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I guess, although, I think you could, you could probably put turnips in the ground in August or September, because turnips are, are cool weather yeah. crops, and, and they will, you know, they'll be green uh, till, till Christmas, pretty much, you know, as long as it doesn't just uh, get too awfully cold. But... Uh, uh, watermelons, uh, I've seen in, I think it came out of this, uh, the Vance Randolph book, that 
Some people told Vance Randolph it was May 10th was the date that you sow watermelons or plant watermelons. Other people said it was May 1st. You know, again, these, when you got traditions that go with a date, it's likely to differ from family to family. Uh, in, in my family, my grandparents always uh, put their Irish potatoes in the ground on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, every year. That was one of the few things that they did year after year the same sort of way. As I said, they, they didn't go by the, the signs so much, but that was, you know, that was, a, that was a tradition in the family. And, uh, of course, we know about the Irish and the potato famine and all that. Ireland became well known for its dependence on, on potatoes uh, many years ago. And other people, though, I've uh, even heard of people insisting that potatoes have to be planted on, uh, on Groundhog Day. And that's really early. You know, we've already passed that nearly a full month ago. So that's really getting around. Uh, you uh, kill and butcher hogs in the light of the moon. And uh, so we wouldn't, since we're, we'd, we've established that we're in the dark of the moon now, we wouldn't want to kill any hogs this week and, and butcher them up. Uh, and again, we've talked about our frostbitten corn and garlic. Just weird stuff. You know, some of this just sounds kind of strange. And a lot of it is uh, what, what Vance Randolph did and people like him, uh, folklore collectors, uh, they would just ask, Randolph moved to the Ozarks after World War I and he spent years visiting with people in the rural Ozarks. He lived in southwest Missouri and northwest Arkansas. Uh, he lived in McDonald County, Stone County. And, uh, and he would just ask people and collect all, this, all these traditions and superstitions that people had. And uh, this book, which is well over 300 pages, is just full of them. Uh, just one example after another. And a lot of these examples come from, uh, come from this book. Some uh, ways of using natural signs to predict Bad weather is coming on the way. And I've heard, I've heard old timers uh, talk about uh, hogs uh, carrying wood or leaves to make nests with. I remember talking to an old timer once who, uh, he was talking about one of the worst winters in uh, the memory of the Ozarks. I think it was 1917, the winter of 1917. And he said he, he remembered uh, hogs carrying mouthfuls of, of uh, leaves and piling them underneath buildings. Of course, back in those days, a lot of the buildings were built on just with rocks on the corners of them as foundations where you could actually, animals could go up underneath the building if they wanted to, the schoolhouse and the church house and stuff like that. And he remembered uh, these hogs building nests underneath uh, buildings before the winter weather really hit, and then it turned into this terrible winter uh, with all kinds of snow, and it was especially February of that year was really bad. And uh, so he remembered that. If a rooster crows at dusk, it'll rain before the morning. Most of us aren't around a rooster on a regular basis, so we've got to watch the weather to find out if it's going to rain. Just think how much trouble you could save yourself. Just go buy a rooster. Yeah. Now, I don't know how he tells you it's going to snow. That's something else. But at least he can tell you if it's going to rain. Uh, a red, I like this one. A red sun rising means rain that day, but a red sunset promises another dry day. So it depends on which end of the day the red shows up. You know, different. Some of the other signs of falling weather... That's a term for bad weather on the way. Uh, and this is one that in my family we swore by, uh, chimney smoke coming to the ground. Has anybody ever heard that one? Most of you probably didn't have chimneys, but what's that? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, one's, eh, that one's probably pretty, pretty accurate, you know. 
Uh, but that one's, uh, the, uh, in, in my family, the, the saying was, within three days, the uh, rain, but it's usually sooner than that, if, chimney, if uh, smoke starts coming to the ground. Uh, now this one's probably, I don't really know what to make of this one, a ring around the moon. If you see, you've probably seen before when there's kind of this faint outline of a ring, like a concentric circle around the moon. And that was, uh, that was one of those folk traditions. If you see a ring around the moon, it's going to rain. Or I've also heard if there's a ring around the moon, you've st you, you count the number of stars inside the ring, and that'll be how many days till bad weather or till rain or you know, whatever you consider bad weather. Most farmers, depending on the time of the year, don't consider rain bad weather. It's usually something uh, they're looking for. Oh, really? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So the ring is ice crystals in the atmosphere. Okay. Well, that's neat. I, I didn't hear that. I didn't know that. See, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the traditions, oh, it's not that the people knew the science, but through long periods of observation, they sort of backed into, you know, like the, the whole smoke coming to the ground. You know, you wouldn't know the science to it. And, and like uh, in, the, in the 18th and 19th centuries when people believed that it was healthier to live in the hills than it was in the, in the swampy flat country, they thought it was because the air in the swampy flat country had some sort of miasma in it that, it, that the air was... Uh, sickening, when actually it was the mosquitoes that were giving them malaria down there, and they, they didn't put those two together, but they sort of they sort of came up with the right answer anyways, get out of the swamps and live where it's a little higher ground. Uh, even, you know, the, the science may have not been accurate, but they kind of got to the right answer. Uh, if it rains, now my, my, uh, uh, my grandfather-in-law uh, swears by this one, if it rains on the first day of the month, it'll rain half the days of the month. I don't know that he's ever been right with that one, but he's, uh, you know, he, he swears by that one. That's a lot of raining. And if you get rain like on the 1st of July, more than likely it's not going to rain half the days in July in the Ozarks. And here's a, here's a good one. The first frost will be six weeks after the Katie Dids start singing. If you can remember late next summer, you know, check for that one, listen for the Katie Dids and mark it on the calendar, just see how accurate that one is. I never remember to do that. There's somewhere in Proverbs, speaking of traditions that, that uh, people had associated with the Bible, there's somewhere in Proverbs where there's a, there's a chapter uh, kind of devoted to women and, and, and different things, and, and one of the old... Uh, wives' tales, I guess you would call it, or old superstitions, was that you could take the day of the month you were born on, the 8th or the 16th or whatever it is, and look up the verse in this chapter of Proverbs. I, I'll have to bring it with me next time I come and, and uh, tell you what it is. And that would tell you what your profession would be if you were a, a woman. Now, of course, we're, we're, if we're talking about the 19th century, uh, Practically all Ozarks women had the same profession, which was homemaker and taking care of the house. Uh, but, you know, there are different references in there to uh, sort of seamstress and, and different uh, prostitute, things like that. You know, all the, the various things that, that women uh, did in, in biblical times. And uh, that's another one of those things that uh, became kind of a tradition, sort of a fun thing to, to look at, I guess. How about your yarb doctors? These were country unofficial doctors, people who practiced traditional medicine using plants and, and oils and skins of animals and, and things like this. And they were often referred to in the Ozarks as yarb doctors, or which is kind of a form of, of herb doctor. 
We got the old Yarb doctors. Uh, Ella Ingenthrone Dunn, who's pictured here, uh, was one of the last of the southwest Missouri rural Yarb doctors, and she was a midwife and all kinds of stuff down in Taney County. And, uh, and there was a, a book written about her in the 70s when there was all this kind of nostalgia for this, this dying knowledge and dying way of life in the Ozarks. But just a few of the many different uh, remedies for, for various things. Uh, whorehound tea. And now, uh, almost all of these come from different kinds of plants or weeds, what most of us would consider weeds, uh, like whorehound. And I've got a few pictures. Once we get through this one, we'll look at a, a few pictures of the, the different plants. You've, you've all seen these things. You may not know what they are. Uh, you may be like me and not really be a, a plant person. Uh, so I don't know a lot of them, but I've, I've got a few pictures up there so we can look at them. Uh, but whorehound tea for colds, uh, butterfly weed tea for lung problems of various kinds. Did somebody get the, the novel Butterfly Weed for your book? Okay, that's, that's the, uh, uh, the, the name of one of the Donald Harrington novels on our book list. Now, poultices were very common. I've heard lots of old-timers talk about their mothers or their grandmothers making them a poultice of uh, different kinds for different maladies. And uh, the poultices could be made of things from plants. They were often made of uh, boiled or mashed up animal parts and, and things like that and, uh, or manure. You know, all kinds, you can, anything that really stunk and was gross, it, it was assumed that that would heal something, you know. Uh, it, was, it was torture for a lot of kids who had to wear these things, and it might be, it might be strapped on you, or you might, uh, you might wear it around your neck, uh, asafetida, uh, poultices and, and different things. Uh, this one, this particular one for pneumonia is uh, chicken manure and lard. How's that for a combination? Yeah, you, you, you may forget you got pneumonia because you're puking from the, the smell. Uh, it kind of gives you something else to be sick about. Uh, but there were lots of these. I, I've heard uh, my, uh, my grandpa talk about wearing uh, skunk poultices when he was a kid. His mother would make uh, a poultice out of like skunk grease or something, which is what it sounds like. It's like a boiled skunk fat or something. Uh, it's just, uh, and I don't even remember, I think it was just kind of in general to ward things off, you know. I mean, everything runs from skunk smell, right? Maybe even illness runs from skunk smell. But uh, can you imagine a, wearing a skunk poultice? Going to school with one of those. I grew up with a, something called the black salve. It yeah. was a petroleum-based product. It cured everything. Yeah. 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 That, and that, that's, that becomes, by the 20th century, those over-the-counter things start to replace. I mean, they're, they're still probably of, of questionable uh, composition. You know, who knows exactly what went into these things. But the, the over-the-counter things start to replace the traditional animal and plant remedies. And so uh, w when I was a kid, we, we weren't doing poultices anymore, but my grandmother still believed, uh, and she was a salve champion. You know, and, and for her, I think, I think what it really was was Vicks VapoRub or something, but she called it salve. And, uh, you know, it, when, when I spent the night with my grandmother, it could be, August the 1st, but you were getting slathered with that stuff on your chest before you went to bed. You know, she just, I mean, that's just what you did when you, when you went to bed. A little kid just got slathered with what she called salve, you know. And it really cleaned out the old head, you know. that. But, uh, and it's probably, uh, probably the same idea, you know, your, your mother using black salve, you know, it's, you know, came in a big jar. 
Yeah. Yeah. Was it was it actually black? It was black. Yeah. And it cured everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it I, you said it was like petroleum based or I something. Understand it probably was. being black, it probably was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. But uh, just think of the list of things that didn't make the cut. Oh yeah. Things that they tried before that were like, yeah. oh, that work. <laughs> That's right. Until they get the skunk oil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, finally, yeah. The, yeah, you can just see the the, uh, the country scientists, you know, checking th things off, you know, control groups and all that stuff, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, you can just think of the of the centuries that go into developing these what are eventually considered to be good remedies for for various things. And the thing about it is, uh, many of them uh, were helpful. You know, that did work in some way. And uh, with our westernized medicine, we pretty much shunned all of that kind of stuff. But a, a lot of people, uh, there are a lot of people who've gone back to alternative medicines and, and probably using, some, you know, some of the, the chapter out of here on, on what he could have called alternative medicines. He didn't. We weren't using the term back then, but, you know, it's basically what that is. And a lot of these, if you read uh, Vance Randolph and some of the other accounts of these of uh, herbal and traditional medicine, uh, a lot of the people credited these, uh, their knowledge of these medicines to Indians, or they would say, you know, great-grandpa learned this from Indians. And probably a lot of them were passed along because uh, you think about the people who settled in the Ozarks, as we talked about before, Many of them lived amongst the Cherokee and, and other groups back east or the Shawnees or whoever it was, and then lived amongst them here for a while as well. And so it's, it's very possible that a lot of these were Native American in origin. And it's also probable that a lot of them were brought even from Europe and maybe just adapted to different kinds of plants uh, once they got into to North America. Some of the others, golden seal root, or slippery elm bark for stomach aches. And this would be something that you would, you would actually uh, consume. Uh, in, in the case of the bark, you wouldn't actually eat bark. Uh, it would be uh, pulverized down and probably boiled and maybe mixed with honey or, or you know, something else uh, th so you could actually get it down. Uh, and, you know, that's... And you can... Uh, they're still... Lots and lots of slippery elm trees in the Ozarks, so you can make your own if you really get interested. Uh, golden seal. Uh, May apple root uh, was, uh, was referred to as loosening weed. That's kind of self-explanatory when you see what it was used for. Uh, but you can, there's still, you can still find May apple uh, all over the rural Ozarks. And we'll see a picture of that. Uh, ragweed tea for diarrhea, which was often called flux. If you ever see the term, uh, if you're re reading a uh, 19th century book or something like that, and they use the term flux, it usually re refers to diarrhea. And uh, black snake root tea for an aphrodisiac. So there were other uses that were not necessarily medicinal. And uh, Vance Randolph has several other examples of of uh, what you might call country aphrodisiacs in, in his book. Here's a butterfly weed on the left, may apple. These are not actually apples, They're, that's the name of the plant. And uh, yeah, they, they do have a little, yeah, a little, a little thing that comes up, a little fruit that comes up on top of them in a, in a bloom. And usually you find may apples in a shaded area of the forest. And, uh, they're big though, right? When they yeah, they, they, yeah, they get pretty big. Yeah, that, not the actual fruit, but the, the plants are, are, they're pretty big. And, uh, and I never like walking through them because it seems like snakes could be under there. I mean, because if you get a big bunch of it, you know, it kind of covers the, the floor of the of the woods for a ways, and it just seems like a. If I if I was a snake, seems like the kind of place I would lurk, you know. Just so. Of course, 
It would be, I, I would probably end up, you know, being one of the rinky-dink snakes, like a green snake or something. About it. And not the, not the kind that we see on wildlife shows in Australia or wherever, that, you know, the poisonous ones, our green snakes. Uh, ragweed there on the left. Uh, black snake root on the right. Uh, not as exciting as they sound. You know, you really, but uh, just some examples of, of these things. Also, I, let me, I was going to do a couple more of these just out of, uh, out of the book, Ozark Magic and Folklore. Let's see. Now, here's, here's an interesting one that, uh, that I never would have thought of. But he's talking about chicken pox. And, you know, many of us had chicken pox. Probably most of us had chicken pox at some. The, the kids, get, they don't get chicken pox anymore, do they? they uh, when, did, when did that stop? <laughs> when did that happen? Yeah, I, I had chicken pox when I was, it used to, I mean, it was kind of a rite of passage uh, when, when I was a kid. You, 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 you had them? Really? My, my kids have never had chicken pox. I think they got some kind of shot for it or something. It doesn't always work. It's not like a smallpox vaccine or something. The, uh, but it's, he says that many points in Missouri and Arkansas country folk treat chicken pox by bringing a black hen and chickens into the sick room and making them walk over the patient's body as he lies in bed. Now, how about that? You know, it, it's miserable enough. You got chicken pox, and then you got chickens walking on you in bed. Yeah, it uh, says. Uh, black hen? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's got to be black. A black hen and, and chicken. It says uh, near Bentonville, Arkansas, which is where Walmart is now, so they wouldn't put up with this craziness now. But uh, I knew a woman who brought a black rooster into her house and placed it again and again upon the bed where a little boy lay sick with chicken pox. I asked a local doctor what he thought of this treatment. <laughs> Well, it can't do any harm, he said. The bed was dirty anyhow. <laughs> there are several funny stories about the black chicken on the bed business, and it may be supposed to accomplish something beyond the cure of chicken pox. Uh, so that's a, a little chicken pox thing. And then there's also, uh, he has a bunch of uh, different cures for alcoholism. And it uh, says, every old woman has heard that owl's eggs are a sure cure for alcoholism. Owls lay their eggs in March, so it's coming up pretty soon, and it is said that many Ozark children are kept out of school and sent by their mothers to search for owl's nests in the tall timber. Many a hillman has been fed owl's eggs, scrambled or disguised in one way or in an, in another, without knowing what he was eating. Another way of curing drunkards is to put a live minnow in whiskey and let it die there. The poor chap who drinks this contaminated whiskey doesn't notice anything wrong with the, with the taste, but it is supposed to destroy his appetite for liquor. <laughs> so that's a, a, a couple of weird examples there. Uh, and the, uh, it really is a neat book, and I encourage anyone who's, who's interested in, in that kind of stuff to, to, to take a look at Ozark Magic and Folklore. It's got all kinds of uh, examples like that in it.